everybody, welcome to Hit Rewind, another episode we're discussing the films of 1991. Can I talk any faster? I don't know. I just got done running around trying to chase a dog down, and my heart is pounding. How's John's heart doing right now? Uh, I've got a cat who wants so much attention, and it's actually kind of frustrating me at the moment. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this happens a lot. I know that sometimes... My sister has the same thing. When she records, her dog is always up in her face. And I can sometimes hear the licking. The little, 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 little. Yeah, so if, it, if any moment I scream out loud, that means the cat has now buried its claws into me. And... Um, yeah, but... I've heard meows, I... so I guess that hopefully that's the most of it. All right, so um, looking at our list, somehow I think you and I discussed doing a film that we did not get around to doing, and that's going to be Doc Hollywood. I don't recall that. Oh, I thought we talked about it in the very beginning, but we didn't discuss it, and we're running out of episodes. Only have one more left with Jacob, so uh, we won't be covering that one. Yes, every year there's going to be 1991 movies that you want to have discussed, but we can't do this all damn day. Um, so we picked four. We picked Necessary Roughness. Uh, I wish I had not marked these out. Life Stinks. Hook and, and the Fisher, Fisher King. King. Yes, all right. So let's do the uh, Robin Williams double feature. All right, where do you want to start? Uh, Fisher King, first time watch. I put this off forever. I have no idea why. I've watched all the other movies from Terry Gilliam, and yet for some reason I just kept thinking, this isn't my thing. I thought it was just a straight drama. This is his best movie. This is Robin Williams' best performance. This may be Jeff Bridges' best performance. This movie is absolutely jaw-dropping, fucking amazing, and I regret not seeing it before. But also, was I mature enough to enjoy it the way I do now? Yeah, that's kind. Of, I think that's kind of my thing too. Is yeah, it's first time watch for me too, and I love Gilliam's work. I may not say, I may not go as far as saying it's the the best film for all three of them, but it's pretty damn close. Yeah, yeah. What what's kind of I like about this is the fact that this is kind of Gilliam light almost. Because, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of like very... door on the floor. You know, the, the, he's done a few of these where it's not so heavy on the fantasy. Yeah, and it's like it, it's there. There's there's you know this creepy uh, first you know first person camera things where people come in really you know horribly close to the lens. You know, you've got gets a few dream sequences, but for the most part, yeah, it's like this is a fairly straight you know straight film. Yeah, it's what I think resonates with me most, and I think it is because I'm in my forties now. Is about regret, loss, uh, bad decisions. Uh, just so many things that you face in your 40s like oh if I can only go back and change this and seeing how some people through the years they've lost who they were I think I mean madness really does take over and I've been there a couple times and seeing how other people look at you and that broken look in their eyes like they want to help you but they don't know how yeah and that's and that's the thing is like there's you there, there's so much uh, empathy for everyone in this that it's it's almost jarring at uh, like not the halfway point but like what two thirds in where uh, Jeff Bridges as Jack ends up you know uh, effectively feeling you know feeling good about himself and he immediately turns back into the prick that we see at the beginning yeah. of the film. Mercedes Rule's like, character uh, just is so broken by what he does and the world in general kind of led her up to this but she thought this might be something different and he fucking threw her away so badly i was so angry but isn't it kind of interesting that this is a world where a shock jock actually does pay for the shit that they say yeah well like, some might say god <laughs> paid rush limbaugh in, <laughs> in plenty <laughs> but it just took a long time yeah, no, this is far more immediate, really, for yeah. this. But that's one of the things also about this film is, it's like, I'm, I'm no stranger to hardcore violence or anything like that, and I was genuinely shocked at uh, when they when we get the uh, flashback sequence yeah. to the, to well, the bar thing, get shot up. It's almost an exploitation shotgun thing, or whatever. Uh, I don't want to ruin it, but, I mean... Because I think a lot of it's because who's involved. They're kind of A-listers. I mean, both had come off of critically acclaimed roles recently. And uh, Terry Gilliam really doesn't dabble in blood and guts unless it's absolutely comical. So it is. It kind of throws you off. You, I did not expect it. Well, it's like because it's kind of in this Coen Brothers, almost like the nonchalant way. I mean, it's we see it's coming. We 
we know what's going to happen, especially because you know by the time we get this flash, as it's a flashback, we've we are we we know what's going to happen, and it's just like the just the blood splatter that it is. I mean, granted, it's also chunky. I think that might be part of it too. But uh, yeah, you just kind of like like whoa, what the. Yeah, well, I, the, weird, the weirdest thing for me, and I don't know if you ever watched the show, uh, The Adventures of Briscoe County Jr.? Yeah. Okay, so Socrates Poole, his you know very wimpy, nebbish sidekick that would give him his assignments, is the one pulling the trigger, and that threw me off, too, because I never expected it. But that's that has nothing to do with it. This was two years prior to Briscoe. But, yeah, and this, this film is based around the Ethereum uh, story of the Fisher King. And uh, I they, they explain it in the film. I didn't write write down the exact story for it, but it does parallel it quite a bit. And it's kind of interesting to see Rob Williams basically playing a knight errant. A what? A uh, knight errant, basically a knight who's there to do noble deeds and stuff. Oh, that's okay. Kind of, that's kind of what you know. He's on his quest for the Holy Grail. Yeah, that that but, part, that whole thing is very Gilliam. So I can see what appealed to him because, you know, you're looking for the Holy Grail. You have that. You have the, the fantasy elements when he's having his hallucinations. I can see a lot of it was appealing to him. And maybe he just saw this as a more of a mainstream breakthrough because you remember Baron Munchausen was a fucking disaster production wise and financially. And that did a, and in Brazil was the same thing. Didn't make any money was, you know, ruined in post-production. So I think he was trying to look for something where... Not only would a studio back him, but he had powerful actors that would also back him up in his decisions. Well, he he, he basically broke his three main rules. He didn't. He never wanted to shoot someone else's script. He never wanted to work in America, and he never wanted to work on a big budget Hollywood film. And he would and, do that actually quite a few times. Now that I think about it, because what did he do after this? Was there a really long gap? No, I think it was 12 Monkeys was the next one, which I think was, what, 94? Yeah, Christmas in 95, and that was a studio release. Same thing for Fear and Loathing. I think he didn't... I want to say Brothers Grimm, he went back overseas. And that was an independent production, but distributed by a major studio, back the way it was before. But he needed those two or three hits. I mean, yeah, look, Fear and Loathing got bad reviews, and it didn't do that well initially, but also it hardly cost a thing, so it, it did very well in video. Yeah, and I like that one. Yeah, so. Fisher King, I think, though... No, I think yeah. Fear, uh, uh, 12 Monkeys was more successful. And maybe even uh, Time Bandits. But this was a, a really big one for him. And um, what was Robin... Oh, no, Robin was about to go into Hook. But what had he done before that? I feel like it was really quiet for a while there. Maybe Awakenings? Uh, yeah, probably Awakenings. I'm yeah. Because I, I know being human, I think, was like 90... Forward. Yeah, so he had done some like subdued roles for a while there, and this you know kind of lets him loose again. But this time it completely makes sense. I don't like it when he's wacky just to be wacky. You have to put him in an atmosphere where it makes sense, like a uh, Good Morning Vietnam or like Survivors, where he's slowly losing his mind, you know, and he's desperate. Uh, for a long time, Survivors was my favorite performance, that, but this surpasses it. Yeah, it's like, I I really like this one a lot. <laughs> this is a nerd note, but when they're in the video store, I don't understand why they have... Did you happen to notice that there's multiple copies of the same movie in the same space, but not together? Oh, yeah, it's because they just need to fill out that stuff, and it's... I I, I can't remember which company that is. It was Columbia. It's, it's the Red Box, um, the, the mid-'80s Red Box, where it had that outline... Do you remember where it was yeah. a red outline? Yeah, and then they would have the, the art inside. But they had, like, Roxanne, like, in six different places. And I'm like, nah, who is the person who did the production design? <laughs> Don't do this. Oh, well, two well, two things. One, that's a shitty video store. I mean, it seemed, it seems like they're mostly a porno section. Yeah, right? that's so, what I was wondering. There's a lot of porn in the back. They're just casually having a conversation in the office, and it's filled with porn. I'm like, is that extra storage, or is that where customers are supposed to come in and get it? I, what? <laughs> <laughs> come in. Ha <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well. sorry. It's been one of those days. I need to, <laughs> need to have... Every day is like this for me. I'm a, I'm a naughty little boy. <laughs> but now, I guess on to the one that I didn't like as much. No, I, I didn't. I've never really cared for this movie, but it got worse this time around. But um, Hook, I was able to appreciate for the performances of uh, Dustin Hoffman and Bob Hoskins 
and the production value is absolutely exquisite. Oh yeah, that's 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 the thing. Robin Williams is fine in this, and I, Dustin Hoffman is is wonderful. Uh, but the film is really it's Bob Hoskins' show. Yeah, they're. I feel and, like they're improving it. I feel like they're just winging it and having so much fun. Those two together, yeah. Bob Hoskins and Dustin Hoffman seem like they're just going on these little segues away from the script. Well, apparently, and I guess they they had to tone it down a little bit. But uh, Hoskins and uh, Hoffman basically kind of they they had their aha moment for their characters when they realized that they were basically just an old gay couple. Yeah, <laughs> makes sense. And, and if you watch the film, especially with that, you seriously you see it at every moment. It's like. Oh yeah, they <laughs> they are a couple, and it is it is lovely. The uh, did you happen to catch the Glenn Close cameo at all? Oh yeah, I, yeah. There's I mean, there's Glenn Close as uh, the guy goes into the boo box. You have uh, oh god, uh, Phil what, Collins, this? Phil Collins. But no, there's also like uh, oh shit, what one of the other guys? Uh, David yeah, Crosby God. somewhere in there, but he looks. Yeah. David Crosby looks exactly like Bruce Mahler, who is a stand-up comedian at this time, who's in Shakes the Clown. I couldn't tell who was who. Well, David Crosby is like the first guy who says he was who mentions the hook. Okay. He's like he's like he's not front and center, but he's pretty he's pretty prominent actually. You know what I don't like about this movie? The kids. What's that? I really oh, don't yeah. like the kids. The, the whole kitty stuff is. I know it was made for children, but it seems so pandering and lower level Spielberg for me because he's directed kids before in E.T. I'm trying to think. Well, of no, here, yeah. This is the problem with that film is it's not a Peter Pan movie. It's a movie that Spielberg made to work out his daddy issues. Oh, that makes a hell of a lot more sense. I mean, I mean, well, there's and there's. It's not like this first film because he's he's got a you know few films that are deal with like broken homes and stuff like that. I mean, E.T. for God's sakes, you know. It, there's there's a lot of it in his work, but this 100 percent is all about you know his his dealing with his dad and then his fears of being you know being a dad on his own as well. Yeah, but it's so heavy-handed in its themes and what it's trying to say and I was just kind of like, all right, we got the point, but again, it's made for children and they needed to be a little bit more on the nose. And and that's the thing is, yeah, the kids are terrible. It's but I they're obnoxious as fuck, especially Rufio. Rufio is the most obnoxious child ever. And when I was a child and saw that film for the first time, I really wanted to fucking be Rufio because he was so fucking cool. <laughs> I worked with his cousin at the Monterey Youth Center, and uh, we would just talk about that all the time. He's like, "Yeah, they just worship him as this one role, but he's done so many other movies. Like that's just the way it works in acting. It's just <laughs> if you get one memorable role, at least you got that." Well, he's also uh, Zuko in the uh, cartoon uh, uh, Avatar. Series. Yeah, but no one knows that on face value. Oh, you have to yeah, they, know. Yeah, they do. That's do the they? Thing is, yeah, he's. That's, wow. Those are basically his two well-known roles. Um, Julia Roberts is exhausting, and I, I I read that her and Steven Spielberg had serious issues, and and just like the performance was way off. But I just thought she was just so over the top yeah we get it you got a good smile please stop <laughs> yeah you know what's funny is i was looking at like alternate castings for this which some of these things i would have loved a lot more even even with characters and actors i think were great like you know you got tom hanks and kevin klein were both up for peter at one point now kevin klein would have been wow yeah i think kevin klein almost got it too uh Sherilyn Fenn and Winona Ryder were up for Tinkerbell. Oh, I would love Winona. Uh, now for Hook, how about a Donald Sutherland or David Bowie? Uh, I don't know about Bowie. I guess Bowie would I, be I, interesting. I, I, yeah, but I feel like he would just be repeating Labyrinth. But one thing, and this wasn't on anything, but I was thinking about it with how uh, Dustin Hoffman was playing it. Wouldn't Michael Wincott have been an amazing hook? Oh my god. <laughs> with that voice? Yeah. No, no, yeah, too fucking intense for the movie. He right. Would... That's another thing though. The tonal the tonal structure of this is really hard. I will give credit to this... Spielberg for doing the best he could, but it does still it's like a breakneck sometimes with the shifts. Well, this movie's so mean. That it's just it's such a mean-spirited film. Even when it even when it's in its joyous stuff and it it, like I will give the film like there's the big magical Spielberg moment though is that where they're 
you got, you got the kids, uh, you know, not wanting to trust uh, trust our hero, and you get that uh, what's his name? I think it's Pockets is the yeah, character's yeah. name. Yeah, goes up to his face, and he's mushing it around, and he finds finds the kid that he knew in there, and it's all that with the score and everything. It's like. <laughs> I'm not crying. You're crying. You suck, Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you make me feel emotions in this piece of shit? There is a kid in here that I recognized. Uh, <laughs> he played Latch Boy. He's the red-haired kid. And every time he spoke, I won. Have you seen uh, Freaked? I've seen it, but long. Oh, okay. okay. So he he plays this kid with huge glasses and uh, popped out ears, and he's always like Ricky Coogan. I kept expecting him to say that. It was driving me crazy. <laughs> yeah, I think the kids are, and a lot of it is what the kids are given to do. I think that Charlie Corsmo is an excellent actor, and he he does the best he can, but the material just isn't there for him. Yeah, it, that that's the thing. It's like it's it's a film that was never. It really shouldn't have been a Spielberg film, even though I think it was originally, it was a film that he was championing, like, back in the early 80s. Yeah, when Nick Castle the, was supposed to direct it, the guy who did uh, Last Starfighter. Yeah, and I think I think if, had it been, had it ended up going under his, his tutelage, it might have been a better film for me in this alternate world, who the hell knows would have Yeah, would have been also, but it would not have been so sumptuous. There's no way anybody would have given that much money. I guess originally it was supposed to be $50 million, but Spielberg just kept going over, and Columbia Pictures just let him because he's Steven Spielberg. And he said he just went at a very slow pace. And I'm like, the studio didn't pay you to go at a slow pace. Nick Castle, he definitely would have knocked us out. I don't know if he would have achieved... Uh, such lofty goals with how it looked because I think a lot of these special effects um, for the time are good yes they're obvious now because you can see kind of an outline when they're flying but I think the set design is truly oh. astounding because everything now feels so fucking fake on the green screens yes I know it's easier but the... yeah it it still looks like the, the that port that they're in it looks like a set let's let you know let none of us ever get some illusions that we think that no, this no. is actually but a real life location what they but put it's amazing yeah it's it's like the popeye set that movie is unwatchable i mean to bring up another rob williams movie and that's the first movie i ever saw i tried, tried watching it it's so dull but god it's beautiful looking yeah it's like it, it's definitely not the best spielberg it's still far from the worst spielberg no no what's the worst you think Oh Lord, uh, I still I'm, I'm thinking I'm one of those people who go like 1942. But... I love 1941, but I get why people don't oh, like 40, it. Yeah, sorry, 41. Yeah, well, yeah whatever. Uh, uh, I think Always is too soft. I don't think he's directed any bad movies. I'm just saying like his weaker ones. And I think I think that Ready Player One was just too pandering. It felt like I'd a say... desperate cry by a man who th was worried that he was out of touch. That's the thing. I liked Ready Player One, but I think I'll, I might might also go with you on that one as well. You know what? Actually, maybe Lost World. Lost World is... What, is Lost World near. has a couple really good set pieces. I'll say this, and he directs the hell out of them. Um, but yeah, it, it does feel like he's regurgitating everything that we just learned from the first movie. Yeah, so... The third it, one's it, better. Yeah, probably those three those those three uh, Spielberg films, I think, are probably weaker than, than this. Yeah. Also, remind me, side note, if I ever do another podcast, make sure I don't grab a drink that has a bunch of ice in it so I make a bunch of fucking noise <laughs> next to the microphone. <laughs> idiot <laughs> sorry everybody all right so what's our next film how about life stinks just finished it sorry <laughs> we almost weren't able to record this episode because i was dragging my ass on it i was very intoxicated last night and i fell asleep um i think his biggest flop i think the movie that nobody ever talks about like maybe high anxiety or 12 chairs i think this is one of his better movies only because for once he's actually saying something is it heavier handed than say like with Blazing Saddles, where it's subtle satire and it also is, I guess, saying something. But this one, he really has a point to what he's trying to do. Well, what's funny is this is, yeah, this is the only Mel Brooks film I hadn't seen. And I genuinely thought it wasn't directed by him. For some reason, even when I've seen his his, his uh, filmography. Yeah, well, like To Be or Not To Be is not his. He produced it and he stars in it, but he didn't direct it. But it's like, yeah, this one, I, I don't think this is a good comedy. Really? I do think... I think this is a very good drama. I think, like, had they 
and part of it's like a lot of it's I don't think the jokes land. Is it because the the style of humor? Because it's very vaudevillian. It's very old school for 1991. It feels like something from 30 years prior, maybe or well, maybe I mean, 40 years prior. Well, hell, I mean, I've I've sat I sat through a silent you know silent film and enjoyed myself. You know him him doing him doing different you know uh, exploring different forms of comedy is not necessarily a thing. I just don't think anything in here necessarily lands knowing okay. anything. things. But as I said, it's like probably the best gag is him getting you know over medicated at the hospital <laughs> because the overcrowding and the and the doctor's just not paying any attention is just handing out the exact same medication to basically anyone that he comes across. He's like what Thorazine, I think. Yeah, he's just, just constantly just giving him Thorazine, not even looking at him. And, <laughs> and the doctor same... goes, "How could this happen?" When he's the one doing it. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that's a that's a good that's a good gag. But everything else in it just like I said, kind of falls flat on that. But as social commentary, as all that stuff, and yet yeah, as you said, it's a bit heavy-handed about the plight of the homelessness and everything. Yeah, as a as a piece of dramatic work, I think it works a lot better. Yeah, I think he pulled his punches with two things. Um... And of course, it's all totally. He didn't go far enough with the drama, and then he may have gone too slapsticky with the comedy. See, we're, the also thing is he's also balancing out the fact that everybody expects parody. There's no yeah. actual parody in this. There is silly stuff and there's setups, but at no point is it completely out of reality. Um, I think one of my favorite bits is when he's just trying to find a warm place to sleep, and. It rings true, but also it's really silly how he just gets knocked right into the trash can the minute he finds a good place. And um, there's, I think, the only time that there's a lot of honesty since Blazing Saddles were in in, in the jokes because it seems like what, what did he do before? So he did uh, Spaceballs. I think Spaceballs was directly before this. Yeah, but what did he do before that? Was it really a long um, gap where he did uh, History of the World Part One? I don't know if there was a long gap between like those two. Like, year, that was cause... 80 or 81. No, it couldn't have been that old. Cause... Oh, okay. But uh, I'm just curious why he had such a long gap there. And then, you know, he ditched. And then he, I, this bombed so badly that he got nervous and then he just went back to the parody stuff. Well, I don't know if he went nervous. or. But, you know, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and Dracula the Dead and Loving, I know have their fans. And there's bits and pieces of Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, or not Prince of Thieves, uh, Men, Men in Tights. Tights that I like. But I think he's exhausting himself at this point for like jokes and, and, and he's already been like um shown up because naked gun and hot shots have changed how fast and how uh consistent the jokes are in in spoof movies well that's it i i, I will i will fight you on men in tights not being good i think that's his last good film but yeah i will 100 percent go uh dracula dead and loving it i don't know there's a Doesn't lot of work. jokes there's a lot of jokes in men in tights that just i feel like they're desperate they're sweating they're just staring at the screen like laugh for us laugh and some stuff is funny i still quote <laughs> stuff from it but at the same time I'm like mm, you really work in this one but yeah it, but that but is also it's kind of a shame that that men, uh, that did loving it is his last feature directoral thing yeah. and as much as i would have loved to have seen producers on broadway I don't think it worked as well as, as a film that considering the fact that we already have producers as a brilliant film and there's a no way on film that Matthew Broderick could ever out freak out Gene Wilder. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like the hairspray, uh, the, you know, how hairspray was a movie then went to the, uh, to the, uh, stage and then when it became a remake, there's something missing from that because there's an energy, this like low budget energy that John Waters had that Mark, that's for they're both Waters, uh, Mark Waters uh, didn't have with, I think he did the, Mark Waters did uh, Hairspray, I can't remember. But I'm looking right here. So this is kind of weird. Uh, so he did a whole bunch of movies right in a row. Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein are literally the same year. Two years later, silent movie. The next year, High Anxiety. Four years later, he has History of the World Part 1 in 1981. Then six year gap. Till Spaceballs. Really? I, yeah. I, I could have 
Well, then, then maybe it was to be or not to be in between that. Cause... Yeah, so he started some stuff. He was producing a bunch because that's when he started yeah. doing. Uh, Brooks, so in that yeah, gap, film. Yeah, yeah, in that gap, he had done Elephant Man, My Favorite Year, Francis, To Be or Not to Be, The Doctor and the Devils, The Fly, Solar Babies, Solar Babies, The Babies, but they're Shola, <laughs> they're Shola Babies. That's a joke only for me. <laughs> I think I've told you this before, and you think it's so stupid. <laughs> but Mel Brooks in the studio just telling, well, uh, uh, Mel, could you tell us what a solar baby is? They're babies, but they're shola. They're shola babies. <laughs> I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm just shaking my head. <laughs> <laughs> just shaking my head. All right, let's go to the fourth film. <laughs> okay, the final one is is a film that I definitely did see in the theaters, and surprisingly, were I don't think I'd seen it since oh, seeing the yeah, I didn't I see it in theaters. I have seen it a, a whole bunch since. Um, Major League in football, basically. But also, hey, yeah. you don't champion this, but you champion the replacements. The replacements is this movie. It is basically the same movie. Yeah, it's like, I really, I will say this, I really liked seeing this again. And it was, I was trying to remember, because I think this was a film that I specifically wanted to see. Yeah. When it's like, hey, would you know is there any movies you'd like to see young young child of ours and i went yes let's go see necessary roughness <laughs> i think it was because they probably sold it on the major league angle and i really yeah. liked major league well and both were produced for such low amount of money i mean i think both of them were like 10 11 million dollars and they just the, here's the thing about sports movies is kind of like like Christmas movies, they know, well, before they made a thousand Christmas movies every fucking year, um, they know that they have a repeat audience. Every single time football season starts or the Super Bowl comes around, they can sell this movie again, either to a TV station or in a different format. So yeah, it, it, it only made like $26 million, but I'm telling you, it probably made $100 million over the 30 years in video sales and TV sales. Yeah. And what uh, this has a pretty this has a really good cast in it because I, I will just say this, you know you got uh, Hector Eliz Elizondo and uh, Robert Loja as the two coaches and they are so fucking good together. Yeah. Well, here's the thing: is the smart thing they did to save money is they found recognizable faces, not necessarily so much names, but guys they could trust that people were comfortable with. I mean, Scott Bakula wasn't a star so much. He had been on a couple seasons of Quantum Leap by this point. But he's so comforting to see, you know? And it really works. I can't believe that he never really had a career in film because he's so damn likable. Well, it's like, I genuinely think that Sinbad's uh, Mr. Crumb would have been the person who would have actually made science fun for me to learn. Yeah. And I, 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 like, I, I like science, that, but he was talking, you know, he mentioned that he had like a chemi you know, uh, chemical degree and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, you know what? If that guy was teaching me chemistry, I probably would have enjoyed it because the uh, my high school uh, my high school teacher, Doctor Priest, because you had to make sure that you addressed him by the proper title. <laughs> oh, that drives me nuts. Uh, so I was, earned this. Give it to he me. Was, <laughs> he was an asshole, and that was not not fun. I had a good sci-fi teacher or sci-fi teacher. What the fuck, <laughs> science teacher? But uh, I wish I had a sci-fi teacher. I had a good uh, science teacher, but uh, I'm just terrible at science. Let's give some credit to the score by Bill Conti. I mean, it is such a good score. Really rousing and fun. Yeah, especially really in that opening sequence where he's, you know, you're setting up the tone of the film and you just have the most, this very energetic, rousing thing and you feel good just watching Scott Bakula throw footballs at a, uh, a spring dummy. Yeah, and he's done a lot of sports movies. Of course, he's most famous for you know Rocky and Karate Kid, uh, Rookie of the Year, I think. Um, God, there's another sports movie in there. I'm trying to remember, but he was just one of those guys during the '80s. He was just everywhere because people were crazy for that sound. And it's so much. I don't see his name ever anymore. But you know, I mean, he's been around forever, so he's probably retired. But uh, uh, the one thing I will knock this film a little bit for is. I kind of wish that I was a little bit more in the uh, Bad News Bears vein as opposed to the Major League vein in that I would have rather watched our heroes lose. Yeah. but well, They do lose a lot, though. They lose a fuck ton. But, yeah, I, I sometimes 
I think back then they were so obsessed with pleasing the audience, you know, because the seventies were different. But now yeah. I think oh, yeah. they yeah. now I think they would probably lose. Um, but I think people just wanted to see these underdogs really win instead of just going the distance, which is more respectable and also audience pleasing. I don't know what I don't know what that's all about. Yeah, lots of things. I, I definitely feel it. Like this is a team that we needed to have seen to have seen them get together and be and become the team that they can come back and win. You know, we, yeah. we want not necessarily that they had to have made a sequel to this sort of thing. You know, because God, then they made Major League Two. <laughs> but I'll say this to bring it back to Scott Bakula: I actually really find Part Three comforting. There's nothing new being said. But there's something about that small town charm and the lowered stakes and the fact that they didn't repeat everything. Everybody in Major League Two, except maybe Tom um, Berenger, is phoning it in. It is just the laziest fucking filmmaking and, and acting I've seen in, in such an expensive movie. Yeah, just just so disappointing. Yeah. Um, but this but this one I, I like I liked a lot. And yeah. I I'm glad I got I did want to see this and see it again and be like and like I said, I'm surprised at how much I remembered from this film because mm-hmm. it's been, God, like 30 years since I've seen this. Oh, really? I watch this every few years. Um, are you – now, do you watch sports at all? Not really. See, I don't uh, either, I, but I watch a sports movie, but mostly comedies. I don't really get into the dramas. What do you prefer? If it's a good story told well, I'll go either way. Yeah. I just sometimes, I, uh, I when I see something like, oh, The Express, based on a true story, I'm like, nah. Is it silly? Nah. But if it's also, is it a kid's movie? Because mm. all kid's movies now are Bad News Bears clones. It's really exhausting. Except for the Bad News Bears remake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'll take the Mighty Ducks. I, I do enjoy those. But uh, yeah. of the four films, what was your favorite? Of the four films, I actually probably have to go Fisher King. Yeah, same thing. Um, that is it for this episode. We're going to be taking a slow break, uh, maybe filling in with something else. I, I have ideas because my brain's crazy. And then we'll jump back into the 1992 season. Where can we find you? I am on a few places on the internet, both uh, Twitter and uh, Twitch under Musician, M-Y-U-Z-I-S-H-I-O-N. I I said last episode that I was quitting Twitter forever, and I'm a liar. (laughs) You saw me. I was so pissed. And I took, I I made it four days, guys. I made it four fucking days. At least there's that. Um, Just, I, I, just find us on Twitter, I guess, for now, until I get upset again. And Facebook and all the podcast hosts as Hit Rewind. And uh, that is it for me. And John, thank you for another great episode. See you guys. Have a good one. All right.